In at number 10, Unconventional Childhood. Growing up, Ellen didn't really have a typical upbringing because her parents full-on believed in Christian science. They essentially used the word of the Bible as their guide to eternal life, which includes how they take care of people when they're sick. It was a system of belief that caused Ellen a lot of physical and emotional pain in her life. The worst part of her childhood was that her parents actually never took her to see a doctor, nor did they give her any medicine when she was feeling ill. Now I'm sure most of her fans would accept Ellen's Christian science past, but others may feel alienated by it, so she keeps it pretty under wraps. As a result of being raised in a Christian science household, Ellen was never even vaccinated as a child. Another secret she doesn't want you to know about. In at number 9, she's a terrible boss. When the pandemic shut down the world, the wealthy among us had a moral choice to make. If you owned a business, do you then give from what you have to keep your employees paid? In Ellen's case, she had a tight-knit and dedicated crew that outlasted a writer's strike and still stuck by her afterwards. Yet when they needed her help, Ellen and her net worth of $400 million said nope. What's worse is that she hired a non-union crew instead to run her show from home. So you force them not to unionize and then turn around and show them exactly why they should have. The backlash comes after Variety reported that Ellen's staff were given no information and entirely left in the dark after filming for the show stopped in March. Oh, and then she said her mansion felt like jail. One thing that I've learned from being in quarantine is that people, uh, this, this is like being in jail. By the way, that's a $27 million mansion. Feels like jail. In at number eight, not welcome in NYC. When the writer's strike kicked off in 2007, Ellen found herself in a strange situation. Because she also writes for the show, she's a fully paid member of the Writers Guild of America. So when the Writers Guild of America went on a strike that lasted from November 2007 to February 2008, she was forced with a tough decision. Does she support her fellow writers or cross the picket line and go to work? DeGeneres showed her support for the strike, but on November 9, 2007, nine days into the strike, she revealed that she would be crossing the picket line. The strike is believed to have cost the Los Angeles entertainment industry over a billion dollars in revenue. Following Ellen's decision, the show ran as usual, just without the opening monologue. Unfortunately for Ellen, the Writers Guild of America were furious. They even said that she was not welcome in New York City anymore. In at number seven, she has a mean streak. In Kathy Griffin's new book, Celebrity Run-Ins, My A to Z Index, she said, I'm almost positive a certain beloved daytime talk show host once had me kicked out of a backstage dressing room at the Emmys Awards. She then goes on to say, I can prove it, but this person who has short blonde hair has a mean streak that all of Hollywood knows about. And I don't think she's talking about James Corden. According to former employees of Ellen's show, this mean streak theory holds up. One insider said, she's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. She's so nice to celebrities, but Ellen's demands that junior staffers don't speak to her, touch her, or even look at her. Turns out she's just rude to most people when the cameras are turned off. In at number six, Ellen Not So Generous. In May of 2019, Ellen had country star Blake Shelton on the show and among other questions, repeatedly brought up his relationship with Gwen Stefani. She then even gifted him with a large clock of the pair kissing that was supposed to encourage them to get married. The clock being a reminder that time is well ticking. Well, when he came back on the show in December of 2019 and other than him being embarrassed by again, Ellen asking more questions about his personal relationship, we found out that he actually never received the clock. And Blake took full advantage of his time on the show to expose was Ellen for not actually giving these gifts to her guests, but instead recycling them whenever she wanted. In at number five, lies for good TV. When Dakota Johnson came on the show, we really got to see that Ellen is not afraid to lie if it makes for good television. First and foremost, she said happy belated birthday, then asked how it was because she didn't get an invite, which leads to Dakota calling her out on that lie. I just can't believe that on top of that, she also was rude to her the last time that she was on the show. Why would you want to come back after that? Now, either she's really forgetful or has lied so many times that she just can't keep track of it because the next part of that interview was confusing to say the least. She then insists that she was never invited and even turns to her producer to clarify that there was no invitation. Her producer then says, you were invited, but you were out of town at that thing. And then the plot thickens because that thing is coming up next. In at number four, fame over values. So not only did Ellen lie about not getting a birthday invitation to Dakota Johnson's party, but that thing that she was doing out of town was even tweeted by her. She says, yes, that was me at the Cowboys game with George Bush over the weekend. 
Ellen was then blasted on Twitter for hanging out with former Republican President George W. Bush. Bush was the president for eight years and fought against gay marriage. He even wanted to make a constitutional amendment in 2004 that would define marriage as a union of a man and a woman. I believe Walker had the best take on this though. He said, here's the thing, Ellen, George W. Bush is a war criminal who is responsible for death on a cataclysmic scale. It's not a matter of being friends with people with different beliefs. We all have those friends. It's about having a little perspective on the damage that he's done. Well said. In at number three, publicity stunts. In a bizarre turn of events, in order to distract from the negative attention that attending a football game with a war criminal brings, Ellen just kissed Howard Stern. While on the show, Stern made note about how under fire she was over the George Bush photo. He then explains that he's on her side and that booking him was a great idea. Howard then suggests that if the pair were to kiss on television, it would switch the focus to them. The really hilarious part about all of this is just how open they are with it. Anyone with a brain can see that she's creating these publicity stunts to drum up controversy and get more name recognition. However, if you were to ask Ellen, she would never admit that it was all just a cover up to hide her mistakes. In at number two, took money from school kids. In 1984, California voters approved the state lottery with an understanding that 34% of sales revenue would go towards education. However, in December, the company just gave Ellen a ton of scratch tickets to just give away to her audience. In fact, each audience member received a $500 bundle of scratchers tickets from the California state lottery. Now, of course, they both saw this as a publicity boom, but a whistleblower from inside the company is suggesting that it was a misuse of funds. The total face value for these tickets was just over $200,000, and by just giving away these lottery tickets on her show, Ellen and the lottery company should be held responsible for that loss. The weird thing is that they even mentioned how the revenue from the tickets goes towards education in Los Angeles. Then she just turns around and accepts the gift with no money exchanged to the charity. Last but certainly not least in our number one spot, Portia moved out. There have always been rumors that Ellen and Portia's marriage wasn't actually going well, and speculation would rise every time Ellen was seen not wearing her wedding ring. Although once being locked down in quarantine with each other and Ellen coming under attack recently for so many things, Portia has officially moved out. Instead of living in the home that they purchased together in LA when they got married, an insider source said that Portia has been living in Montesino Heights for weeks. The source went on to say Ellen tries to appease her by giving her whatever she wants, like her art company and buying any home Portia falls in love with. However, some time apart will do them good. They love each other so much, so I don't think they're about to give up on their marriage just yet. Coming in number 10, The Secret Gift. When Elvis Presley passed away on August 16, 1977, the world was in shock. Elvis' daughter Lisa was in the next room when her father passed away. Just being nine years old at the time, the future singer was perhaps more overwhelmed than anyone else. Knowing that she couldn't just send her father off in a coffin without something special from her, she decided to place a special gift in inside his coffin. While thousands of fans queued up to pay their final respects to Elvis, just before the doors opened to the venue, Priscilla and Lisa Marie would be escorted to where her father was laying. While the king was styled to look his best, looking upon her father for the final time, Lisa Marie would make one special request. Funeral director Robert Kendall recalled that Lisa asked him if he could give her gift to her father. Robert recalls that she held up this thin metal bracelet and that he agreed once her and Priscilla ensured it would not fall into the wrong hands. With thousands of fans outside, they feared someone would see the loose bangle on Elvis's wrist and take it as a souvenir. So Priscilla and Robert placed it on Elvis's wrist and tucked it underneath his shirt cuff to ensure no one would be able to take this precious gift given to him by Lisa Marie. Number nine, the empty seat. Lisa Marie spent many of her days at Graceland as it was her home and heart of Elvis Presley. And she loved the mansion so much because it immortalized the rock and roll legend. Lisa made no secret of her love of the special property that she was reared in and still called home. The late star was lent on the mountain of memories from her childhood to keep the Presley family traditions alive. And that's why she still visited the luxury property regularly to do things Elvis and her used to do. After being open to the public in 1982 and becoming the second most visited private visited private house in America, it became hard for so many to believe that the inner workings of the house still functioned, but Lisa Marie ran a tight ship after inheriting her father's estate. While the kitchen appliances were said to still work, they would be turned off for fire safety. And when Lisa Marie and her family were 
there, the staff would fire them up so the family could have dinner in the mansion. When the tours wrapped up, Lisa Marie and her loved ones could clamor around the huge dining table for family dinners and they would occasionally leave an empty seat on the end in honor of Elvis. It was almost like she hoped her dad would walk in through the doors and take a seat at the table. But Lisa Marie's favorite excuse to get together was the Thanksgiving holiday so she could be with her nearest and dearest father. Hey my little peaches, are you liking this video so far? If so, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Coming in at number 8, we have the upstairs room. For millions of fans who flock each year to Elvis's Presley's Graceland Estate, the home has become a place where they can truly get close to the king of rock and roll. However, Graceland was also a private home for Lisa Marie and her extended family. This is why the upstairs rooms remained off limits to tours of the house which began in 1983. Lisa Marie will also admit that the upstairs rooms has this creepy shrine to a bygone era when her father was still alive. While all the rooms remained the same as Elvis had left them, Lisa would show off the upstairs rooms including Graceland's secret room that holds a treasure trove of items. And the location of this exact room still remains a secret to the public. Behind the door that's marked employees only lies a room that no Graceland guest can visit. While the room is so secret, when Oprah's camera crew was allowed to tour the estate, they would have to turn off the camera until they were inside so no one would know the exact location. Inside the room lies treasures that have never been seen by the public. The room was made to be earthquake proof, fireproof, and tornado proof. Items in the room include checks signed by the king of rock and roll, and majority of Elvis's costumes and cabinets that house over 60,000 photographs. Number Number 7. Struggles Nearly 5 months after her passing, Lisa Marie Presley shared an essay she wrote about navigating grief following the heartbreaking passing of her son, Benjamin. Sources close to the star would exclusively tell the US Sun that the musician was leading a reclusive life and was struggling in the wake of her son's passing. Lisa struggled to find respite from the pain of losing Benjamin and she found it really difficult to cope with and this is why she barely left the house for months after his passing. While Lisa Marie looked for various ways to help her manage her feelings of grief and loss, she even started to go in and out of the Church of Scientology for many years as she was trying to find herself a new purpose. And in spite of this, those close to her had concerns and one insider even confessed that Lisa had been struggling so much over the years and living in her dad's shadow. Many who knew her feared that she would pass away at a young age. Lisa is said to have had a lot on her plate in the years and months ahead of her passing and she was struggling personally with her family relationships and handling her exes. Number 6. Isolation Due to Lisa Marie's personal struggles, she spent her final days on trying trek between Los Angeles and Graceland. Source close to the family echoed that by saying Presley who lived most of her life in the limelight had been living a reclusive life and had especially struggled since her 27 year old son Benjamin passed away in 2020. In Lisa Marie's final years she was racked with grief over Ben as he was her baby and he relied on her so heavily. So after she found out that he had passed away her whole world completely fell apart and she found it really difficult to cope with so she spent most of her days in isolation. Despite her personal struggles, Lisa Marie always tried to keep in good spirits, at least when she did venture into the public. And her final speech at Graceland would prompt fans to erupt in applause. While Lisa would also address her grief in an essay for people, she would say, Grief does not stop or go away in any sense, a year or years after the loss. Grief is something you have to carry with you for the rest of your life, in spite of what certain people or culture wants us to believe. Lisa was struggling and never wanted to admit it, but her heart had been shattered since losing her son and the grief took a huge toll on her. Number 5 Priscilla Presley. Lisa Marie had mended her relationship with her mom Priscilla Presley after her son's devastating passing despite years of prior estrangement. It said that Lisa Marie had a really rocky relationship with Priscilla due to her troubles and breakdown of her marriage to Michael Lockwood. But they became close again after Ben's passing and Priscilla supported her as much as she could. During Lisa Marie's divorce with Lockwood, Priscilla chose to stand by him which caused a lot of friction between the mother and daughter duo. During this time, Priscilla was only able to find comfort from her friends as the relationship between her and Lisa fell apart and she was at loss over what to do at the time. While Lisa filed for divorce in 2016, 
and claimed she found images of younger people on Michael's computer. During the divorce, after losing her husband and mother, Lisa would turn to substances to numb the pain. While Michael denied the allegations, it would lead to a messy court and custody battle. And while Lisa needed her mom the most, she knew that her mom was on her ex husband's side and that she couldn't turn to her for help. With only Lisa knowing what was truly on that computer, she never really detailed the things she actually found on that computer to the public. Number four, the alarming red carpet appearance. Extra host Billy Bush did the final Golden Globes red carpet review of Lisa Marie Presley and immediately realized that something was amiss. Just two days before her passing, Lisa Marie would walk the red carpet at the Golden Globes. She attended to support the Elvis biopic of her father. Since Bush has recalled his brief red carpet talk with an ashen and unsteady Lisa Marie by saying she was very uneven in her balance, the speech was very slow and definitely when the interview was over I turned to my producer next to me and said something's off here she was certainly with it just a second slow but she was there she was definitely there just to tad off in some way. For the interview, Stars had to navigate two steps to the platform where he stood, but Presley was struggling to do so, so Bush went down and met the star on the red carpet itself. Also, there's been videos at the event that show her walking unsteadily and being escorted by her manager who grabbed her arm to give her support. It's clear that something was going on with the star and she didn't want to talk about it. Number three, the safe place. Much has been said about the secrets that lie within Elvis Presley's Graceland bedroom. The private sanctuary has remained off limits to the public since his passing. However, during an interview in 2013, Lisa Marie spilled secrets about the room and she would say Elvis Presley's bedroom was one of the places she would feel the safest. It said that Lisa would always keep a key for the upstairs with her and go up there and up there was just Elvis in her bedroom. While the rooms are said to be a sanctuary, she always felt like she could shut the door and feel the safest and calmest. This is why she kept the area the same as Elvis has left it. The area still having a lot of Elvis Elvis's flair for the flamboyant and reflected the decorating taste of the 1970s. The king of rock and roll, only child admitted, oh, it's showy. It's got a long shag carpet, a black bed, and red walls, gold, everything here and there. Number two, the friendship with the Duchess of York. Sarah Ferguson, Duchess of York, penned a touching tribute to Lisa Marie Presley after the singer passed away on Thursday, revealing their surprising friendship. Sarah would say, I say hello to you every day and I love you, my sissy, and I will continue to say hello to you every day. You are my sissy, an amazing mother to Ben, Riley, Harper, and Finley, and a super bleep loving daughter to Priscilla. You have been my devoted friend for many years and I am here for your family to support and love them. I am deeply saddened, my sissy. You are in my heart. A close friend to Prince Andrew's ex-wife told page six that the two women originally met when Lisa was living in Sussex, England with her ex-husband, Michael Lockwood, back in 2010. Apparently, they hit it off straight away and that they just seemed to understand each other. Over the years, the pair became quite close and kept in touch when Lisa moved back to the States. Lisa was always really supportive of the Duchess and when she was going through tough times. And Lisa even offered her refuge in Hawaii to weather out the storm. The Duchess was never able to forget that. And Lisa even went out of her way to support her friend and that the two actually really bonded as sisters. And coming in number one today, we have the secret job. Although Lisa was a singer and songwriter that spent most of her life in her home country of America, the daughter of Elvis also called Sussex home for a while. While she also laughed herself a very different type of job when compared to her usual career as she was actually working in a fish and chip van in the village despite owning a 15th century grade 2 listed country mansion it appears that Lisa wanted to get stuck in with the village life and thought the best way she could do that was to serve the locals. The van was apparently owned by local pub owners Kim and Justin Scales and it was a job that Lisa reportedly loved doing. Back in 2012, Kim would say that the singer could not wait to don an apron and serve people and she found it really amusing when people did not know it was her. Although being the daughter of one of the most iconic singers in the world, Lisa wanted to be fully integrated in the life in Sussex Village and she really enjoyed her shift. Starting off this countdown in no particular order, 
corner, we have Woody Harrelson. Woody Harrelson's dad, Charles Harrelson, was an American hitman and organized crime figure. Yes, you heard me correctly. Beloved actor Woody Harrelson had a father who was a cold-blooded killer. He was just seven at the time when his father first went to prison. It said that he was responsible for the deaths of at least 20 people. In 1979, that is when Charles committed his biggest kill of all time. He took out a federal judge by the name of Judge John H. Wood Jr. He was the first federal judge to be killed in the 20th century. He was paid $250,000 to kill off this judge. It was because a drug dealer was about to be sentenced by this judge who was known as Maximum John because he always gave out really harsh punishments to drug dealers. So he got Charles to knock him off for him. But this landed him behind bars and in solitary confinement. He was there until he was 69 when he died from a heart attack. Obviously, Woody does not want to be defined by his father's actions. In our ninth spot, we have Joaquin Phoenix. Joaquin is one of the few actors who actually grew up in a cult. He was born into the commune of Children of God. But when he was four years old, his parents managed to escape the cult and move. That's actually why they changed their last name to Phoenix, as it symbolizes rebirth, since they were able to leave this cult and start a new life. Unfortunately, he also lost his brother at a young age. In 1993, his brother River Phoenix died from an overdose. Joaquin witnessed this happen, and he was the one that called 911. In our eighth spot today, we have Phil Lewis. Phil Lewis is best known for his role of Mr. Mosby on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, and I freaking love that show. Like, it was honestly my childhood. Well, before his Disney Channel days, he actually killed someone. In December of 1991, Lewis fatally hit a 21 year old woman. She passed away from her injuries from the hit. It was found that Lewis was driving while intoxicated. His blood alcohol levels were three times the legal limit of intoxication. As a result, he was convicted of a DUI as well as manslaughter. He was sentenced to five years in prison, two years probation, and 350 hours of community service. But he managed to only serve one year in prison. I guess Disney was able to overlook his past when he auditioned for Mosby on the show. In our seventh spot today, we have Tim Allen. Now, if you look at Tim Allen, you think, aw, he's such a family man. I love Home Improvement and Toy Story. He's a great actor. Well, Tim Allen actually had quite a dark past before he got into acting. In 1978, Allen was arrested for attempting to traffic more than 650 grams of he was arrested in Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport. Now, he actually would have served a lifetime in prison, but he avoided this by giving police information about other dealers. As a result, his sentence was reduced to three to seven years. He ended up serving two years and four months in prison and then was granted parole in 1981. I guess that's why they say don't judge a book by its cover because he looks like a wholesome dad, not a drug trafficker. In our sixth spot, we have Jack Nicholson. In 1974, Time Magazine discovered that Jack's sister, June, was actually his mother, not his sister. How wild is that? So June was only 17 when she became pregnant with Jack, and she wasn't married, so her parents agreed to raise the child as their own, with Jane and Lorraine acting like his older sisters. So his parents were actually his grandparents, and his sister Lorraine was his aunt. In regards to his dad, we don't know for sure who is his dad, but some say it was likely June's manager. Other sources claim June really just doesn't know who the father was. By the time Jack found this all out, his mom, June, and his grandma had already passed away. Imagine how that would have changed his life. Like he was raised on a lie. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Sean Penn. A number of women have come forward saying that Sean Penn has been aggressive towards them. In fact, he has mistreated a number of his partners, including Madonna. They were married from 1985 to 1989. While in December of 1988, Penn allegedly tied Madonna to a chair and held her hostage for nine hours and apparently hit her multiple times. When he untied her to let her use the bathroom, she fled to the police station. One officer said, and I quote, Madonna staggered into the station. She was distraught, crying, with makeup smeared all over her face. I hardly recognized her. She had obviously been struck. Sean was charged with inflicting corporal injury and traumatic conditions on Madonna, as well as battery. But Madonna withdrew her complaint a week later and has rarely commented on it since, which is quite odd. Why would she say that he harmed her and then retract the statement? So who knows what really happened? Happened. Moving on to number four, we have Leighton Meester. Now, I personally did not know this, but Blair Waldorf, aka Leighton Meester, wasn't always the queen bee of Manhattan. In fact, she was born in prison. Basically, her mom was serving a sentence after smuggling a lot of marijuana 
out of Jamaica with the help of Layton's dad and Aunt Judy. All of them ended up behind bars. In fact, her aunt managed to escape prison and became America's first woman on the US Marshals 15 most wanted list. How insane is that? In the end, Layton's grandmother raised her while her mom served 16 months in prison. Thank gosh she didn't follow in her family's footsteps. In our third spot, we have Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken was involved in a death that is just shrouded in mystery. On November 29th, 1981, 43-year-old actress Natalie Wood was found dead, floating face down in the Pacific Ocean. She was on a yacht with her husband, Robert Wagner, and Christopher Walken when this happened. The thing is, no one really knows what happened to her. Some say she slipped off the deck and fell into the water, while others are convinced that her husband or Christopher Walken had something to do with it, or that they know what happened. One theory is that Natalie and Christopher were having an affair, Wagner found out about it, got mad, and pushed her off the yacht. Now, Wagner seems to be the prime suspect, but many people think that Walken knows exactly what happened. I mean, he barely even talks about the case, and on the rare occasion that he did, he would call it an accident, and also, he was absent from the documentary about her. All I'm gonna say is someone knows something. I'm getting the vibe that Walken knows what happened and maybe he just feels guilty about it. In our second spot, we have Charlize Theron. Charlize Theron actually had a very traumatic upbringing. Her dad struggled with alcohol addiction and would constantly threaten Charlize and her mom, Gerda. He would never physically hurt her, but he would hurt Gerda. One night in June of 1991, he got angry and fired shots at both of them. During that altercation, Gerda ran and grabbed her own handgun that she had kept hidden and shot him back. Her shots killed him while Charlize watched it all unravel. In the end, it was declared self-defense and Gerda never faced any charges. But think how trauma traumatizing that must have been for her to see her mother shoot and kill her dad as a teenager. And in our number one spot today, we have Ashton Kutcher. Now, I never do this, and I was incredibly shocked when I found out about it. But on February 21st of 2001, Ashton Kutcher went over to his then-girlfriend's house, Ashley Elrin. The two had planned on going to a post-Grammy party, but when he knocked on the door, there was no answer. That's because Ashley was dead on the floor of her home. She had been stabbed 47 times by a man named the Hollywood Ripper. He was responsible for the death of up to 10 women. As a result, Ashton Kutcher lost his girlfriend very suddenly and in a very traumatic way. He was also scared that he was going to be a suspect in the murder investigation since his fingerprints were on her door, but he never was, but he did have to testify in court. Coming in at number 10, we have Corey Monteith's substance struggles. According to Frederick Robertson, during the early Glee days, Corey Monteith was really concerned about maintaining a clean image. When he got the role, he knew he was supposed to be a good kid. And he didn't want his past getting out. With Glee being the beginning of his success, he didn't want the world to know that he was struggling with alcohol and substances. While his struggles may have been kept a secret to the public, Corey had no problem with disclosing them to his close friends and roommate, Justin Neal. In 2008, Corey would admit to Justin about his substance use in the past and that he was trying to stay sober as it was a big part of his life. According to the docuseries, Corey started skipping school to do substances at the age of 13 and he went on to attend a dozen schools, including programs for troubled teens, and often stole large sums of cash from his family. At the age of 19, his mother and friends staged an intervention, leading him to enter into a rehab program in 2001. It wasn't until Glee's second season that he went public with his struggles, admitting in an interview that he wanted to share his past so people didn't assume he was exactly like his all-star character, Finn Hudson, by saying, I feel like I had to step in at some point and relate to people with my experience and where I come from. Corey's publicist, Leslie Diana, also said he wanted to go public to help others as Corey wanted to show them that you could come out on the other side and do well in life. Number nine, Corey and Leah's relationship. Lee stars Leah, Michelle, and Corey Monteith didn't go public with their relationship until 2012, but according to Garrett Greer, an assistant to the executive producer on seasons one and two, they first got together years earlier in 2009. He would go on to say they had been an item before the show premiered, and during season one, or part of it anyway, Leah and Corey were involved, and then later the relationship came back full force. Later, Garrett would go on to describe Leah as a narcissist, and then would go on to note that the other members on the Glee set also didn't think they were a good match. Even the set decorator, Barbara Munch, would make a comment about the relationship when she said, it seemed odd because it was about her always, and I think he just accepted that. Doug Kirkpatrick, head of hair department in season three, would also go on to say, that Corey and Leah's relationship also had a negative side
side effect on Corey's mental state. And he said a lot of Corey's confusion had a lot to do with his relationship with Leah Michelle. I don't know if she was a friend. I think she was involved with him because he was on a TV show. Patrick Chinzel, a key assistant location member, would also ask the ultimate question if that Leah was good for Corey. And then he would go on to say, I hope so. I would think so. I know other people who say maybe that wasn't necessarily true. It seems like people didn't really understand why Corey was dating Leah, and many felt like she wasn't good enough for him. Hey my little peaches, are you liking this video so far? If so, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Coming in at number 8, we have Naya Rivera and Leah Michelle's hated each other. If you were a fan of Glee, or you watched just one episode, then you would know it's no secret that Naya, who played cheerleader Santana, and Leah, who played the dorky Glee girl no one liked, Michelle, were at odds most of the time, but you may not know they were at odds in real life as well. Naya herself, who passed away in an accident while she was boning in 2020, wrote about the friction in her 2016 memoir, Sorry Not Sorry, and would write, One of the Glee writers said that Leah and I were like two sides of the same battery, and that about sums us up. We are both strong willed and competitive, not with each other, but everyone. And that's not a good mixture. In the documentary, Naya's father, George, spoke of the pair's rivalry and he would say there was always a fight between them. Always. Everybody knew. Everybody saw it. They hated each other, but at the same time respected each other's talent. George would also note that Naya even complained about Leah to production and it would cause Naya to be briefly let go from the cast. Number seven, Naya Rivera's dad's warning. Naya Rivera's dad, George, recalled the last time. Time he spoke to his daughter, which happened to be via FaceTime shortly before she passed away. George would go on to say, I get a sinking feeling because we've been boating forever. I was on FaceTime with her, trying to talk her through the pitfalls. First of all, I said, Naya, you're on a platoon boat. That's not a boat. Why are you on a platoon boat? I said, do not jump off that effing boat. If you got an anchor, you can anchor it, but do you know how to anchor it? We went through a couple of interactions like that, and then the FaceTime call hung up, and that was the last time I talked to her. After he received a call from authorities about his daughter, George would begin a multi-day drive from Knoxville, Tennessee to Ventura County, California, but even though he considered his daughter was a really good swimmer, he instinctively feared the worst by saying, I knew immediately when I got the phone call in Knoxville that it was over. You don't find a drifting five-year-old child asleep on the boat at the end of the lake without his mother and have any hope. I had no hope. And speaking about his grief, he would also say, you don't process it. I don't know what everyone else does, but for me, it's as fresh today as it was two years ago. He would also later add that Naya knew she was on a really good show with lots of tragedies and that he didn't know if you could equate that to fame, but he thought it had something to do with it. Number Number six, fame. Corey Monteith's former roommate, Neil, said that Corey struggled with fame as Glee's popularity skyrocketed and the show's fandom intensified by saying there was a period where it seemed Corey was getting more and more isolated. He just got to the point where he just hated fame. He said, I'm just so tired, I want to rest a bit, I'm sick of singing these songs, and I remember him specifically saying, I wouldn't wish fame on my worst enemy. Neil then continued to say, I'd seen the fame, but I didn't realize how hard it was until then. I think with that level of fame, you lose sight of who you are to every single person. He wasn't Corey anymore, he was now Finn. We just knew he wasn't in the best place. Neil would also add in the second episode, in the documentary The Price of Glee, that Corey became frustrated with Glee's demanding schedule and wanted more freedom with his career as he had to turn down movies and he was becoming more neurotic and isolated. However, Neil did know as much as he didn't like fame, he knew how lucky he was and never took that for granted. Number five, the competitive cast. The cast members in Glee were all relatively unknown before they appeared on the show. And as they began to become a household name, their social media pages also started to take off. As Glee increased popularity, so did its stars. When the cast members' social media began to rise, they were all poised to dominate emerging platforms, but their competition wasn't always friendly according to the docu-series commentators. Doug Kirkpatrick, who was head of the hair department in season three, would note that he would often see the actors gathered talking about how many people they acquired as followers and that it quickly became a competition. He would also say, in the beginning, they had to tweet every day and it was Leah. 
who really had the numbers. Journalist Andy Swift would also note that the actors started competing on their social media pages and they almost began to fight about it immediately. So it must have hurt a lot knowing that even in real life they would be in superior to Leah Michelle. Number four, peer pressure. One of the most controversial allegations in the documentary hinted that Corey Monteith was sober before his passing, but that a co-star encouraged him to drink and it went downhill from there. In the documentary, hair department head Doug Kirkpatrick recalled one of the final times he saw Corey in the troubling story the actor allegedly told him. Doug would say he wasn't drinking, he didn't have any substances in his system, and then the very last couple of days I saw him, he was different. He was under the influence of alcohol, he said he was at a party, he hadn't been drinking, he wanted to have a drink but knew he shouldn't. And he was told by a certain cast member that same night, you know, if you want to have a drink, you should have a drink. I'll be here for you. You can always trust that I'll be here for you. Doug also would go on to add his opinion by saying, in my opinion, you would never say that to someone who is sober. And so that confused him and kind of made him mad and he started drinking because he was given permission by somebody. While Doug did refuse to mention any names, he would choose to keep the alleged Glee member a secret because he wasn't there when it happened and he didn't hear the Glee member say it in person himself. However, Doug would add that Corey resented it but also took the direction and that he believes this is the moment that sent him on the path to self-destruction. Mark Salling was largely unknown before he landed the role as Noah Puck Puckerman, who was Finn's best friend and like Corey, he was a bit older than the rest of the cast. At the time, it has been said that both Mark and Corey were 26 when Glee premiered. But according to Munch, Salling's age wasn't the only thing that made him stand out among among his co-stars. Munch would say he was quieter, for sure, and kept to himself because I think he felt more of an adult than the others. Just was, you know, a bit off and he wasn't just a regular young man. He had some issues going on, it seemed obvious. Then a few months after Glee ended its sixth season run in 2015, Salling was arrested for possession of illegal photos and videos that contained younger people on them, a charge he ultimately pleaded guilty as part of a plea deal. He then took his own life on January 30th, 2018 shortly before he was scheduled to be sentenced. Even Glee director of photography Christopher Baffa from seasons 1 to 3 would say Salling's offset behavior didn't jive the person he experienced, but he acknowledged that actors are typically on their best behavior once they get around the crew. How did he get there? He was a great guy. What happened? I don't know. Number 2 forced return. While creator Ryan Murphy now believes Glee should have ended after Corey's passing, at the time he largely left the decision up to Leah Michelle. With various options on the table including a 6 month hiatus or cancelling the show altogether, Leah chose to return to work just 2 weeks after her boyfriend and co-star's passing. Back in 2013, Leah would tell Ellen, I said we have to go back to work, we have to, they're my family. However, many of the cast members interviewed in the docuseries were not supportive of this call. Jody Tanka said, it was only a couple of weeks, all of the actors had just pulled themselves together to get back to work. Everyone was kind of forced to. J.A. Byerly, a rigging gaffer on seasons 1 to 5, said Fox was conscious that Glee was about to cross the 100 episode mark. The traditional threshold for ultra profitable. They wanted a product, so we spit out a project. They were looking for 100 episodes. In October 2013, Glee paid tribute to Corey in the quarterback, the third episode of season 5, and the episode follows the members of the Glee Club as they cope with their grief in the wake of Finn's passing. Honoring his memory with emotional performances of songs from season, from season of Love, If I Die Young, and Make You Feel My Love. Glee ultimately went on for two more seasons after Corey's passing, but Briarly says he was never far from the cast and crew's minds, and you could always feel an emptiness because Corey wasn't around anymore. And coming in at number one today, we have the Glee Curse. Over the past few years, there has been much talk about the Glee Curse, but the cast seemed to reject this theory. Kyle Birch would say, I remember someone mentioning the Glee Curse to one of the cast members, and they got pretty upset about it because they were like, no, this show is not cursed. Cursed. There is no Glee curse. Eric Greer would add that bad things happen, it's life, and unfortunately with Glee there was more tragedy than any other show, but not everything could be full with sunshine and rainbows. Christopher Baffa would also add that ultimately, those close to Glee want the show to be remembered for spreading inclusivity and positivity, not tragedy. He would also say, I don't think Glee is ever going to outlive the tragedies of some of the cast tensions or some of the things that were said about it, but I'd hate to have those aspects as real 
as they are, take away from the good that was achieved because I do believe that good was achieved. Starting off this countdown in no particular order, we've got John Hamm. John Hamm is most notably famous for his role in the hit television series Mad Men as a cutthroat advertising executive. What he may not want you to know about him, however, were his less than savory college days that landed him in some serious trouble. In 1990, John was arrested for his alleged role in a fraternity hazing that turned horribly violent. His fraternity house was even dissolved after Ham and his friends harmed a pledge so violently that he was in the hospital, even going as far as to light him on fire. John was charged with a misdemeanor offense, and when he was asked about it in 2018, his response wasn't the best. Well, I was essentially acquitted. I wasn't convicted of anything. I was caught up in a big situation, a stupid kid in a stupid situation, and it was a bummer. I moved on from it. Okay, now we're moving on, I guess. In at number nine is Richard Pryor, the iconic comedian who is often cited as direct inspiration for other comedy legends like Eddie Murphy and Dave Chappelle, Pryor changed the game. But what you may not know is that there was an extremely dark past behind the All Smiles comic. Richard grew up in an extremely unstable childhood, raised by a substance using mother in a brothel in Illinois. Richard saw things that no child should ever have to see, and to cope with such a horrifying childhood, he also turned to substance use to self-medicate. Richard was married seven times to five different women who had trouble with the comic's insatiable personal life. He even almost passed away at his own hand when he doused himself in rum and lit himself on fire while using substances. Pryor's friend even stated in an interview, quote, he has about 13 personalities, and while you could deal with nine of them, the other four are a nightmare. At number eight is Billy Tipton. Billy Tipton, if you haven't heard of him, was a revered jazz musician who rose to fame in the 1940s and 1950s. He lived his life in relative normalcy outside of his celebrity status. Although he was never married, he did have five serious girlfriends, all of whom referred to themselves as Miss Tipton. Eventually, he settled down with a woman named Kelly, and they adopted three sons together. It wasn't until his death from a stomach ulcer in 1989 that, as he was being rushed to the hospital, his giant secret was uncovered. Billy Tipton was born a woman and had concealed his sex throughout his entire life, even from his relationships. The revelation came as, quote, a shock to nearly everyone, including the women who had considered themselves his wives, as well as his sons and the musicians who traveled with him. To explain away any intimacy that would have happened between his partners, Billy reportedly said that he was in a serious car accident that mutilated his body, leaving him unable to perform. At the time this was revealed, it sent shockwaves through the music scene where trans performers were basically completely unheard of. In at number seven is Prince. The iconic pop singer is considered one of the greatest musicians to have ever lived, but he also had a secret that was only uncovered upon his tragic and sudden death in 2016. After he passed, many stories started to come to light as both bank statements became public and from various sources. These bank statements revealed that Prince had been secretly donating insane sums of money to various charities throughout his life, each with the condition that the donation be private and that the donor be kept a secret. A few organizations that he did support in the days before his death were the Harlem Children's Zone and Uptown Dance Academy in New York. He even donated $12,000 to the Louisville Free Public Library in order to keep it from closing, all under the condition that they keep his name unlisted from donor records. He reportedly gave thousands away at a time, particularly to charities related to children, as his own child tragically passed away after only six days of life. He also focused on environmental issues, and uniquely, unlike a lot of celebrities who choose to invest so they get a financial return, Prince just donated to foundations that support environmental causes and a transition to solar power. Number six, Jimmy Page. Jimmy Page is the virtuoso guitarist and founder of Led Zeppelin. Jimmy is largely known as one of the greatest guitarists in the history of rock music. I mean, he set the standard for the many who have imitated his electric style. Yet, what he may not want you to know about him is his predatory relationship with a young girl who was only 14 at the time. While he toured with Led Zeppelin, Jimmy dated Lori Maddox, although they kept their relationship extremely private and basically hidden because it was, you know, illegal and creepy. Even in the loose 70s, this relationship could have put Paige in jail. They dated for a little while, and who knows what they did behind the scenes, but Jimmy eventually dumped her for B.B. Bell, who was of age at the time, thank God. Either way, not a fan of this one. In at number five is Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick is known largely for his titular role as Ferris Bueller in the John Hughes coming of age film, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. He was also in The Producers and a bunch of other A-list movies. What you may not know about him, however, is that he was directly involved and in fact caused the death of numerous people. He and Jennifer Grey, the star of Dirty Dancing, were on a romantic vacation in Ireland when Matthew head-on hit the car of a 
28 year old woman and her mother. Both women were pronounced dead at the hospital. The road was straight and easy to navigate. The issue was that they were in Ireland, and he, out of habit, drove on the wrong side of the road, which led to the crash. Following the accident, Broderick was convicted of careless driving but was only fined $175, which to this day the family of the victims called a quote, travesty of justice. At number four is Jackie Chan. While Jackie Chan appeared as a comedic kung fu fighting man on the screen, his personal life is absolutely insane and surprisingly not well known. In fact, Jackie himself didn't know until well into his career just how many secrets were being kept in his family. He learned in 2003 that he had two secret brothers living in China and that his father was a nationalist spy on secret missions to bust substance crime in mainland China. In fact, that's where he met Jackie's mother. In what seems like a moment straight out of a noir crime boss movie, Jackie's father met his mother, Li Li Chan, because he was sent to bust her as an infamous dealer and legendary gambler in Shanghai. So his mother was one of the lords of the Chinese underbelly and his father was sent to arrest her. The two fled to Australia together where they lived until their death. Jackie's father also revealed that the actor's real family name isn't Chan at all, but rather Fang. How's that for a family reunion? In at number three is Rose McGowan. Rose was one of the founding spokespersons in the Me Too movement, joining dozens of women who brought Harvey Weinstein to justice. She is best known for her 90s movies like Jawbreaker, Scream, and Encino Man. But what you may not know about her is her rather horrifying upbringing. She was born in Florence, Italy, where her parents lived in a commune called the Children of God. Basically, she was born into a cult that had mass allegations of horrifying crimes against humanity. I can't really say what they are because of YouTube restrictions, but if you're curious, I suggest you look into it with a serious content warning in mind. The cult in question lured people in with promises of all kinds of physical intimacy and activities with extremely young women set to perform such acts on the men in the cult. Luckily for Rose, she was largely protected from the more heinous side of the cult and she and her family fled when she was 14 years old, where quote, we hid in an old stone house and had to boil pots of water to take baths. The cult sent people to find us. I remember a man trying to break in with a hammer. Number two on the list, Rihanna. While the celebrity singer is in the news lately for her exciting pregnancy with ASAP Rocky, what you may not know about her is her rather insane early life and the secrets that they kept even from her until they were finally brought to light. Old family photos were unearthed that reveal a secret side of the family that Rihanna herself rarely ever talks about, her father's other kids. Rihanna has three older siblings through her father by three different women as he admitted to being quite the womanizer in his heyday. Her and her father have an extremely complicated relationship as he has dealt with substance use issues for most of his life. And now to find out that she had three other siblings she knew nothing about, it's a wonder the two have stuck together through so much. And in at number one is Mark Wahlberg. The actor and singer needs no introduction, but he may need a little disclaimer beside his name for the rather horrifying incident he caused in the 80s. When he was 16 years old, Mark had an extremely harsh life and he ended up brutally harming an elderly Vietnamese man in a racially motivated attack. He shouted slurs at him while physically harming him so badly that Mark was charged with attempted murder. While he was sentenced to two years in prison, for some reason he only served 45 days. In a beautiful show of faith, his victim, whose name is Johnny Trin, stated that he forgives Mark. Quote, everyone deserves another chance. He was young and reckless, but I forgive him now. He paid for his crime when he went to prison. Mark got a pardon from the court, basically exonerating him from his crime, an action that he later stated he regrets. Quote, I didn't need that. I spent 28 years righting the wrong. I was relieved to find out that the injuries to his eye had occurred in the early 70s and not from the incident that happened that night, but I was able to meet with him and his wife and his daughter and apologize for these horrific acts. Some good can come out of it. And at number 10, Harry and Meghan are related. This should be taken with a slight grain of salt because at some point if we go back far enough, we're pretty much all related. So as we know, Meghan was born American and of course Harry is British, but they still share some DNA. The Daily Mail did a genealogical investigation where it was revealed that Harry and Meghan are cousins dating back to the 15th century. The connection is on Markle's father's side. But of course, it's 15 generations back, so there are no real connections still intact. And there's zero chance anyone will be related at family gatherings. In at number 9, Always Wanted to Be Famous An old friend of Meghan's came forward after the engagement claiming that Meghan always wanted to be famous, even since childhood. She not only loved being the center of attention from a young age, she was very calculated in who she spent her time with. Nanaki Pretty told the Daily Mail, quote, 
All I can say now is I think that Megan was calculated, very calculated in the way she handled people and relationships. She is very strategic in the way she cultivates circles of friends. Pretty also claimed that Meghan always wanted to be famous. Royal scholars have pointed out that this trait is a positive for Meghan and Harry's relationship. Apparently most of Harry's other relationships didn't work out because the women he was with did not like all the attention. But clearly this is not an issue for Meghan. Penny Jenner, author of Prince Harry, brother soldier's son, told The Express quote, One of the advantages of Meghan is because she is in the public eye, she likes that. The real problem with Harry's girlfriends in the past is that they absolutely hated the media attention that scared them off. In at number 8, Meghan cheated with Harry. After Meghan was confirmed to be dating Prince Harry, it came out that there might have been some overlap between her relationship with Harry and with her ex who was Canadian chef Corey Vitellio. Before she started dating Harry, Meghan was seen out with the chef on multiple occasions. Nobody thought anything about her past relationship until a fan noticed that Vanity Fair changed the date when Harry and Meghan started dating from May to July of 2016, because apparently she was still with the chef in May. Harry and Meghan first met at the Invictus Games in Toronto, and when Harry asked for her number, the Telegraph reported that she was still with her ex. The Daily Mail actually asked the chef about his split with Meghan, and he claimed that he and Meghan had quote, parted permanently when Harry came on scene. However, he did somewhat hint that the pair might have been together in some capacity while she still was with Harry. And at number 7, fame changed her. After news broke that Meghan was marrying Harry and would become a princess, Many sources came out saying that fame had changed her, and she's all about climbing the social ladder. In December of 2017, news broke that Samantha Markle, who is Meghan's estranged half-sister, was planning a tell-all book about Meghan. In an interview with The Sun, Samantha said, quote, Hollywood has changed her. I think her ambition is to become a princess. Samantha also complained that Meghan forgot about her after gaining high society status. A source close to the family told E! News that Samantha cannot be trusted. However, Samantha is not the only person who says this about Meghan. Meghan's former best friend, Nikandi Pretty, told the Daily Mail in December 2017, quote, There's Meghan before fame and Meghan after fame. And at number 6, chose career over marriage. Before Meghan was known for her role on Suits, she was actually married to a producer named Trevor Engelson for two years, before they eventually split. The split was apparently caused because of Meghan's work, and a former friend said that Meghan clearly chose her career and work over her husband. The former friend, who served as a maid of honor at Marco's wedding to Enkelson, told the Daily Mail, quote, It was such a shock when she told me they were getting divorced. Apparently, the stress of the long distance relationship is what caused the main issue. Meghan was living in Canada at the time, filming the show Suits while her husband was in LA. Apparently, Enkelson was heartbroken over the split and did not see it coming. Halfway at number five, does not treat animals well. Meghan Markle likes to be known for her humanitarian and social efforts. One thing that Meghan is very proud of is that she adopted two dogs from a rescue shelter. But it seems that it was not happily ever after for the two puppies. After Meghan became a princess and was set to move to Kensington Palace in 2017, a spokesperson confirmed that Markle's retriever, Bogart, would not join her overseas. Apparently, Meghan felt that it was inhumane for the dog to take the long trip, along with the difficult approval process for dogs coming into the country, and Meghan left the dog with one of her friends in LA. Then later in December, Daily Mail reported that her other dog, Guy, broke both of his legs. We're not sure what the circumstances were, but apparently Meghan was quote, distraught over the accident. In at number 4, Meghan cut off her friends. After Meghan split from her ex-husband, it was said that she spent a lot of time in London. While there, she apparently formed a friendship with local TV personality Lizzie Cundy after attending an event together. Lizzie disclosed that Meghan wanted her to help finding a new man. Apparently, Meghan wanted him to be British and famous. In a 2019 tell-all, Cundy wrote about Meghan, quote, we were having a girly chat and then she said, Do you know any famous guys? I'm single and I really love English men. So I said, We'll go out and find you someone. Apparently, Megan was interested in soccer player Ashley Cole, but it didn't go anywhere. Then Megan apparently slid into the DMs of X Factor winner Matt Cardle in 2015, but shortly after that, Cardle just stopped replying. But apparently, after Harry showed some interest in Megan, Megan felt she had no need to stay in touch with Lizzie Cundy anymore and basically ghosted her. Apparently, Cundy asked Megan about Harry, then they chatted for a bit, but never saw each other again. Cundy added, quote, I was literally ghosted by her. In a Number 3. The staff hate her It was reported that while Meghan and Harry were living in the royal palace with the other family members, the staff hated Meghan so much that they started to quit. In October of 2018, a palace aide and assistant named Melissa quit because of quote, Hurricane Meghan. Apparently, Melissa was a longtime aide of the families and a trusted assistant, but that all changed when Meghan came into the picture and annoyed the staff with her requests. Apparently, Meghan adopted a lot of West Coast habits like waking up at 5 a.m. and quote, bombarding aides with texts. 
One source told The Mirror, quote, Megan put a lot of demands on her and it ended up with her in tears. Melissa is a total professional and fantastic at her job, but things came to a head and it was easier for them to both go their separate ways. Apparently, Megan's tension with her staff also caused a rift between Megan and Kate. Kate apparently called out Megan for her strict and disrespectful behavior towards the staff. In at number two, inappropriate requests. On the day of Harry and Megan's wedding, Megan wanted everything to be exactly the way she liked it, which is usually what happens for normal weddings. Well, at royal weddings are much different, and most of what happens is passed down for generations and become very strong traditions for the royals. Megan tried to change a lot of things around for her wedding, which people did not like. One of the most offensive requests was when Megan asked for air fresheners to be deployed in the chapel where she was to get married. Apparently, the smell inside St. George's Chapel was not good enough for her. British Insider stated it does have somewhat of a musty smell, but it is not unpleasant, and it's expected for a building that's been around since 1475. A source said that Meghan wanted the staff to go around with spray guns to make it smell better, but the request was denied. The source said, quote, Royal household staff stepped in and told her office politely but firmly that this was the Queen's Chapel and it simply wasn't appropriate. I don't believe a request of that nature has ever been made before. And finally at number one, Meghan knew she wouldn't stay royal. The exit of Harry and Meghan from the royal family was devastating news to many. But after further investigation, it seems that Meghan might have known she was not going to be a royal for long. And she might have even concocted this scheme to get the most amount of press possible, then to leave the royal family and go back to Hollywood, where she's always wanted to be. When it was announced that the royals would be leaving, everyone blamed the decision on Meghan, as she was the only change in the family before Harry's formal exit. British columnists said that they think Meghan did not know the difference between being a celebrity and being a royal. Canadian millionaire Kevin O'Leary even slammed Meghan, saying she was the reason that nobody cares about the couple anymore. Quote, I think Megan got him into a bad place, and maybe she should do a little soul searching. She knew what she was getting into when she married him. Page Six also reported that Megan put some clothes in a storage location in Canada before she got married. She then decided to keep them in Canada, and they were sent to the couple's new Vancouver home after the Megxit announcement. Maybe Megan left them there because she knew she would be coming back. In at number 10, Leighton Meester. You'd never be able to tell by how she carries herself today, but this Polish celebrity was actually born in a Texas prison while her mother was serving time for drug smuggling. Though her mother was allowed to spend 12 weeks in a halfway house with newborn Leighton, she was soon sent back to jail. Meester ended up living with her grandmother in Florida until her mother was released. At 10, her family moved to New York so that she could begin a career modeling, only to then pack up again four years later and head to Los Angeles. Once in Hollywood, she began auditioning for various roles while taking acting classes, but she found it difficult to relate to kids her age because of her unstable upbringing, an upbringing that she kept hidden for a very long time. Her breakout acting role was when she portrayed Blair Waldorf on Gossip Girl, a character whose mother was the owner of a fashion empire, which as you can imagine was a stark contrast from her actual childhood. Today though, she was worth an estimated $16 million. In at number nine, Selena Gomez. In typical rumor mill fashion, when singer Selena Gomez decided to cancel part of her world tour in 2013, the gossip magazines did all kinds of speculating as to why. They said she was battling a drug and alcohol addiction and listed a plethora of other unconfirmed conspiracies. The real reason that these types of stories kind of bubble up is because of how secretive celebrities are. Although, can we blame them? I'm sure there are some parts of their life that they just want to keep quiet. And turns out Gomez had been hiding a secret from the world, but it had nothing to do with indulging in addictions. Later on, Selena revealed to Billboard that she had to undergo chemotherapy to treat lupus, a chronic autoimmune disease. She mainly wanted to wait for the right time to talk about it, and when she did, she didn't want to be loud about the whole thing. Selena just wanted to wait so that she could properly use her platform to help spread awareness. In at number eight, Prince. Prince has always been a wild and eccentric character. I mean, in 1993, he literally changed his name to a symbol. If that's not the definition of an enigma, I don't know what is. Although this brilliant musician was hiding a big secret from the world. For his entire life, Prince had been coping with epilepsy, which is a serious medical condition. Although in 2009, he revealed this secret during an interview with PBS. In the interview, Prince told host Tavis Smiley, I'd never spoken about this before, but I was born epileptic. I used to have seizures when I was young. My mother and father didn't know what to do or how to handle it, but they did the best they could with what little they had. Although Prince said that after a while, he was able to keep his condition largely under control. He also noted though that this control over his epilepsy came by way of an angel that spoke to him. In at number seven, Katie Holmes. Just five days before Tom Cruise celebrated his 50th birthday, his wife of five years, Katie Holmes, filed for divorce in New York. The world was completely shocked by this secret being unearthed. The couple had been spotted together on the set of Oblivion in Iceland just days 
before and they were strolling along like nothing was going on. Everything's fine. Don't look at us. Apparently Holmes orchestrated her escape, if you will, from Cruz very carefully. She set up secret meetings with lawyers and prepared to battle for sole custody of their daughter, Suri. Now, although the details leading up to this was kept secret, if you were watching the tabloids, one could assume that she was using them to shift the public's perspective. Katie Holmes used the sympathies of the tabloids to convince people that she was just this kind of passive wife of Tom Cruise was a maniac. It's believable, right? The weirdest part was that right after her divorce, she had all of these events set up where there would be people there to photograph her. Normally, following a divorce, you would think that you'd, you know, take some time to yourself, you know, take some time off from work maybe, but nope, nope. She just went right to the cover of the August issue of Elle magazine. In at number six, Caitlyn Jenner. Back in 1971, Jenner participated in their first decathlon, and by 1972, Jenner was competing in the decathlon at the Munich Olympics. At those Olympics, they finished 10 10th overall in the event, and in 1976, Jenner went on to win the gold in the decathlon at the Montreal Olympics and was declared by the media to be the world's greatest athlete. Jenner was able to accomplish all of this while living with a deep personal secret that wouldn't be shared with the public for, oh, I don't know, another 40 years? In 2014, Jenner announced that they were divorcing from longtime wife Kris Jenner, and just a year later, Jenner shocked the world when they revealed that they had undergone Jenner reassignment surgery. At the age of 65, Caitlyn Jenner introduced herself to the world, and by 2015, ESPN had awarded Jenner the Arthur Ashe Courage Award, and to this day, Caitlyn is one of the most prominent public figures to come out as transgender. In at number five, Lance Armstrong. In 2012, champion cyclist Lance Armstrong denied that he ever relied on performance enhancing drugs. He referred to the doping allegations against him as outlandish and heinous. However, when the US anti-doping agency revealed compelling evidence, the cyclist house of lies began to crumble. The agency released about a thousand pages of evidence in doping allegations against Armstrong and his teammates. This led to him being stripped of seven Tour de France titles and bronze Olympic medal, plus his secret forced him to step down as chairman of the Livestrong Foundation. Armstrong would later give a detailed account of his doping to Oprah Winfrey in 2013. You know, I view this situation as um, one big lie that I repeated a lot of times. In at number four, Arnold Schwarzenegger. The secret that Arnold kept ended up being the bombshell that destroyed his marriage. Just five days after Arnold's then wife Maria Shriver gave birth to their fourth son in 1997, the couple's housekeeper, Mildred Patricia Baina, also gave birth to a son by the same action star. He kept this child of his a secret until he completed two terms as California's governor in 2011. Then he finally confessed his infidelity to Shriver and later the public. All it took was the media identifying the mystery baby mama and and thus the celebrity scandal had been completed. There have always been celebrities that kept their kids out of the public eye, but nothing in terms of what Arnold was able to pull off by keeping this all a secret for so long. Imagine seeing that kid and be like, this kid looks like Arnold's son. Is that Arnold's son? In at number three, Charlie Sheen. No one has really been attacked in the press like Charlie Sheen has. Not saying he hasn't earned some of his controversies, but let's just say that there are some very shady people in this world. The notorious actor appeared on NBC's Today Show in 2015 to announce that he was HIV positive. Charlie had been diagnosed with HIV four years prior and finally revealed his secret after several people actually tried to blackmail him. Allegedly, there were some people threatening to reveal this secret unless he gave them $10 million. I'm here to, to admit that I am in fact uh, HIV positive positive um, and I, um, I, I, I I have to put a, a, a stop to this, this, this onslaught. If the timeline is four years from this interview, then his diagnosis would have come right as this whole controversy with the show Two and a Half Men started. You know, the one where he said in a bunch of interviews that he had tiger blood and Adonis DNA. Like, it's no wonder with that much press on him already that he didn't want to also reveal what could even be perceived as a weakness to his health. In at number two, Drake. This one was a huge reveal because for so long people were just simply speculating on whether or not Drake was dating someone. So when Pusha T released a track with a line directed at Drake that said, you are hiding a child, let that boy come home, Adonis is your son. Everyone that was watching that feud had this jaw dropping moment when Drake finally revealed his secret son named Adonis. How did Pusha T know this? Drake would later record a song called Emotionless that explained why he had kept his son hidden from the public. He just didn't want to expose 
expose his son to the world that would have had their eyes on his every move. And it's understandable, but I believe it baffled people because it wasn't like he was like happily married to someone. He, he appeared to just be this rolling stone that was always rumored to be romantically involved with one celebrity or another. Last but certainly not least on our number one spot, Justin Timberlake and Jessica Biel. Like many celebrities on this list, JT and JB have had an awful time trying to keep their personal lives out of the public eye. One thing that has certainly helped keep a lot of secrets is well, this pandemic. I mean, if the paparazzi can't come within six feet of you and everyone's on lockdown in their homes, the tablets must be just suffering right now. Although the Daily Mail still found a way to honor some celebrity secrets when they revealed that Jessica had secretly given birth to a baby boy. The family are thought to be in Big Sky, Montana, where they have been spending time amid the coronavirus pandemic, and both of them have neglected to share any details whatsoever about the pregnancy, so I guess we'll have to check the Daily Mail if you want info on that celebrity secret. Oh, <laughs>